today we're looking at this is the review this is the review this is the review hello youtube subscribers hello once again youtube people once again youtube it's the lazy eyebrow reviewer why hello youtube it's the lazy eyebrow reviewer hello youtube greetings from the lazy eyebrow reviewer it's the lazy eyebrow reviewer here with another review you've seen generation thundercracker and generations thrust and now the lazy eyebrow reviewer and faceless joe are proud to bring you another redundant seeker why hello youtube greetings from the lazy eyebrow reviewer insignobots transform stage one insignobots Transform! Stage 2! Merge into Devil Logo Awesomeator Lazion Eyebrow Miss Reviewer to Supremenator! Why, hello, YouTube! Greetings from the Lazy Eyebrow Reviewer! Hello and welcome to another Wackamas HD. Wait a second, where the heck am I? Why, hello, YouTube! Greetings from the Lazy Eyebrow Reviewer! Here we go! Here's a greeting for you because it's now time for a Lazy Eyebrow Review! Greetings from the Lazy Eye Bagel Reviewer. So, you may be wondering, what does this have to do with today's review? NOTHING! Yes indeed, welcome to the final review. And just like Jazz was our second and second last review, it only makes sense that our last review be about Astro Train. So today we're looking at the 2017 Titans Return Astro Train. Astro Train was a trip. <laughs> what? We've waited six years for your hundredth review. And now you're just going to reenact your very first one? You're an idiot. What's wrong with Astro Train? Just Astro Train. What about tracks? Didn't you promise us Grimlock like four years ago? What? You told me Metroplex was going to be the hundred. All right, all right, all right. What if? What if I cover everything I haven't covered yet in one single review? Would would that be okay? I guess we're reviewing everything. And as a special treat, I'm also making this review available in stereoscopic 3D. That being said, although this review is in 3D, unless you're watching the 2D version that is, we're going to start with footage of reviews that were filmed in 2D but never came to fruition. So then, section 1, filmed but not produced. So first things first, I said three years ago that if I ever made it to review 100, I would review a certain Titan class figure. So then, rolling into view was none other than our original Generations Titan class figure, Metroplex. Metroplex is a figure I've had for about four years now, but promised myself I would review it on the 100th as kind of incentive to go that far. Little did I know at the time that this would be as far as I would get. So yes, Metroplex. This is him in his first mode, a mobile battle station. And, well, to me, this just looks like a weird aircraft carrier on wheels. I say that because this part, which, you know, is clearly not its chest or anything, isn't mounted like any sort of actual aircraft carrier, but being it's fictional, who cares? Like, this thing is armed to the teeth with cannons up top, at the side, at the very top. Man, this thing couldn't really be more armed if you tried. Also features a ramp from the deck to the command center. I actually really, really enjoy the flight deck. How long it is, how it goes two ways, toy hacks designating the runways left and right, how when you land on an articulated arm pops up to perform repairs on the scale planes, roll them with cargo, just to taxi around and take off again. I don't know, I think this mode is just the absolute coolest of the three, but the other two are right up there. So let's talk about them. City mode. Well, as best as the city as you can get, really. Though I'll give it this, the alt mode is way different from mode 1, which is a lot more than I can say about Lordy Lordy, look who's 40. Anyway, city mode, which means he has to be having at least 2,500 inhabitants to be allowed to call himself this. Otherwise, it's just a really, really expensive town. Regardless, expensive town mode has some cool highways that lead to the central core. Here he is with some HO skilled vehicles, and here he is with some micro machines. They were the only vehicles I could find that looked remotely good of him. 
Up top is a helipad that's bigger than the other one that is also weirdly still visible. Like, unless we're talking R-Wings with their G-Diffuser system or something, I don't exactly see how we're landing sideways. Something else neat is if you have Creons, they can hang out in the downtown square and not look too too out of place. As an expensive town mode, he really does look great with all the skyscrapers and spires and junk poking themselves up against the backdrop of the sky. I quite enjoy the look. Alrighty then, robot mode. Once you fold everything up, man does he ever make an impressive figure. Standing there like the big tower of a biped in expensive town mode, you know, would become. He's just... wow. Fort Max is definitely chunkier, but there's just something about Metro here that's just impressive in stature. So he also comes with guns, one is a skyscraper, which begs the question, where does everyone go when he transforms? Do people just hang out in the buildings while he walks around? That'd be weird, wouldn't it? Imagine you're just at work, filling out some forms, in your office on the 43rd floor in the middle of an expensive town metroplexia, when the building rumbles, everything shifts sideways, and you're being flung around and aimed at people, and then you hear a powering up noise, the elevator shaft of your building is getting ready to shoot 1.21 gigawatts of power through the barrel of your office tower. And let's not forget what that must look like from the other end. You're just walking down the street when you come across the crater where metroplexia used to be. You look up, and you find yourself looking down the barrel of the general commons tower. The sheer absurdity of what Metroplex is just amuses me on levels I cannot put into words. Anyway, if the General Commons Tower isn't enough firepower for you, then the Twin Peaks apartment complex perhaps might be more your style. Yep, Metro gets the dual wield, and that is awesome! And while we're at it, the individually articulated fingers means that in Mother Russia, City swings around the Spider-Man. And yes, he can also superhero pose. And you too can recreate that one scene in Fall of Cybertron, where you press X to punch the Megatron. Probably the best part of the game, hands down. So that was Metroplex. Was he worth waiting 100 reviews for? Yep. He is truly an impressive figure, and one that I will definitely miss out of my entire collection. On then to everyone's favorite repaints, The Seekers. Featured here is Koopy and Bao and Yes Model's take on Masterpiece Starscream. And what a burden it was to get him in the first place. It took a total of seven attempts to get a Starscream at all, as most were eBay scams, one of which I actually lost my money on, and in the end, I didn't end up happy with either of these KOs. So let's cover why. On the left is Kubi and Bao's version. This Starscream comes in the grey with the white wing striping. This is accurate. Unfortunately, this version is also brittle, and the joints feel mushy. So much brittle so, that we'll get into a little bit later, but also this figure came broken right out of the package. I wasn't happy with that. Transformation sketched me out to boot. On the right is Yes Model's take. He comes in the white the American MP03 Masterpiece Starscream came in with the details picked out in grey. I enjoy that the details are there honestly, but the white in general is really really bugging me, as is the random silver where the jet engines are. There really is no reason for this. Functionally, they're both the same. They pretty much come with the same things, except Kubi and Bao also comes with the firing missile projectiles, which I never used because first off they look weird, and second, you can't really animate that nonsense. I just find it really, really weird that Yes Model decided to go with the inaccurate paint scheme because I also have their Skywarp and he's a perfect replica down to a T with much better joint and plastic tolerances to boot. Just for some reason Starscream gets chinsed out on. And that brings me back to me and Starscreams. I don't know what it is, but I just can never seem to get along with Starscream. Even back in the Generations line, finding two Skywarps was infinitely easier than hunting down a universe Starscream for some reason. I didn't even buy the second Skywarp, I just happened upon it at a toy fair and was like, eh, I already got one. But Starscream, man, hard to find a universe one, took seven attempts to find a masterpiece, and when I did get a masterpiece, it was trash quality, and then I got the Yes Model version, and it doesn't even look the part. Ugh, Starscream. He asks me. He tasks me, and I shall have him. I'll chase him round the moons of Nibia, and round the Antares maelstrom, and round Perdition's flames before I give him up. For the best color comparison, yes model, Kubi and Bao, yes model, Kubi and Bao, and so on. Alrighty, transformation. And here we are at robot mode, and again, it's the Kubi and Bao that looks far more accurate. Yes model looks good in its own right, but it's not cartoon accurate. And so help me, if someone says Make Toys Meteor is what I should have gotten with its super inaccurate jet mode, yeah that's what I really should have gotten. Anyway, both come with the coronation gear. Unfortunately, while filming, Kubi and Bao's bracket that attaches the cape to the back actually snapped. That's how brittle the plastic is here. It's a shame, really. 
Doth mother know you weareth her drapes? And lastly, a group photo with the other two seekers. I am glad I was able to get all three in Masterpiece format. Yes, the MP11 mold does need updated. I'd go as far to say it's outdated. In general, the seeker design is inherently flawed. The designers are tasked with finding some way to hide the tail fins in robot mode, hide the feet in jet mode, have everything flip upside down, and still fit securely, and still somehow also support its super top-heavy self at the end of the day. This is something I didn't like Make Toys Meteor for. Sure, it's got the better articulation and the better tunage proportions, but its jet mode just doesn't hold a candle. And I get to some people, jet mode doesn't matter. They don't care about vehicle mode, they just care for robot mode. That being said though, for all that extra articulation, they sure seem to have forgotten to support the heels of the stupid thing. In the end, I do like Masterpiece 11, and by extension, a lot of aspects of Masterpiece 3. They were designed with vehicular accuracy in mind, and this was what I really, really liked about Masterpiece back at this time. Nowadays, there is a ridiculous amount of focus on tune accuracy, and that really hampers down on the vehicles. Look, a cartoon front end. See this Mitsubishi logo? It's there if you feel like it, I guess. But it doesn't have to be. It can be a fully tuned vehicle. I'm a scale model enthusiast. I know a lot of people know this. And since selling my Transformers, I've recently regained a massive interest in my model train hobby. So, yeah. Scale model accuracy is kind of a big thing for me. And I, for one, have been disappointed as of late from the vehicle deviations. Anyway, moving on. Section 2. The Toy Hacks Era. For a time, I was working for Toy Hacks doing sticker ads for them on their channel. However, because I'm leaving the Transformers scene, I requested to leave the company. As such, there were a few figures I filmed for them that I also meant to film for my own reviews, but never got around to it. So let's go ahead and cover them. Coming down and landing is Titan's Return Scourge. And wow, what a massive difference from the Generations figure they slapped the Scourge name onto. That really only reminds me of that character from F-Zero AX, the arcade counterpart to F-Zero GX. This space boat of a vehicle actually is reminiscent of the G1 counterpart, much like the universe Cyclonus was. So he gets to have a companion piece, finally. Awesome. And then we hit robot mode and it's like, oh, hello Scourge, nice of you to finally join us after the last seven years. This is the Hasbro variant though. The Takara one nails the colors even better, unsurprisingly. Being though he is a season three character, I have no affinity with him and we'll move on to Skull Smasher or Cruncher, or whatever he's called nowadays. He's a crocodile that is super pink and dark green. See now this is the color scheme that would have rocked my socks off of Victorion instead of the cruddy, whatever it was color scheme we ended up getting, that everyone said no, it's supposed to be a faded green and a rusty red, even though the promotional art doesn't show it that way. It's good that way, you should like it. Well I didn't like it. What I did like though is the articulation in this guy. It made for some fun animating with the ball jointed neck, and that big open maw, and the like. It was a really, really cool alt mode. However, I've seen a total of four Headmaster episodes, and let's be honest, they're super boring. I hear the series does get better after the sixth or seventh episode, and infinitely better once you hit victory, but I've only gotten to the sixth or seventh episode, and I haven't gotten much further. So let's move on. He does turn into a robot like everything else. I had no idea what to say about him beyond he's a robot. He's pink and green. He looks like a crocodile. Yay? I don't know. Chrome Dome! Chrome Dome I remember mostly from that US version of Headmasters from a failed attempt at Season 4 where it's humans that are trying to help the robots. However, this concept didn't fly with the Japanese and they just ended up retconning everything America did and redoing it a ton better. We'll get into that a bit later though. His car though, kind of reminds me like a 1976 Pontiac Grand Le Mans crossed the 2002 Pontiac Grand Prix. And the result is, oh, so cool! I like the almond and the chocolate paint scheme this guy is rocking out. The way the car is just designed. It's really, really cool. And then you transform it, you find out it's just dead end mold as a headmaster. Whoop de stinkin' do. My least favorite Commander Moore's mold materialized itself in front of me as a really cool car. You really had me going there for a minute, Hashtag. I was genuinely interested in this thing. And then I went to transform it. And at first it seemed a little too familiar. And then it clicked when I was finishing it. And it's like... Why? Why this? Why the dead end mold? Why this? I hate the dead end mold. I cannot begin to say how much I hate the dead end mold. <sighs> Moving on. So fans project has been kind of absent lately, yeah? For a while, they were all anybody could talk about, and now they're unheard of. And in a world where masterpiece scale is the norm and everyone's just okay forking $200 over on average for another set piece for their collection, 
What exactly has Fans Project been up to? Well, you know, just making classic scale Dinobots. An already risky business maneuver that didn't really sell so well in the first place turned completely on its head when Power of the Primes announced they had G1 style Dinobots that of all things combined coming. And thus, we only got five of the six planned Dinobots. I only have four of them as the female Dinobot just came out way too late in the game for me to order, and I have a feeling Snarl has never seen the light of day to complete the set. So let's cover the four that I do have. Swoop is a Tyranodon that we shall call Petrie. He is also a figure fans project stylized to look what scientists now believe they look like when walking around. It's kinda cool. Walking around on all fours instead of those stubby legs, he's still Petrie through and through, just stylized. Longer legs and a different wing configuration. When you hit robot mode, it's like, ah, there's Swoop. I have him in uniform red, but Fans Project also included an entire blue torso for you to rip off every ball joint with great difficulty on the figure and replace it with the blue that it's your fancy. I don't like it. I like the Dinobots having a uniform scheme, so I personally leave it red. Articulation's great. I kind of like the style they went for. And in general, I think he's a good figure. And then on to Slash. Right. Dang it, UK, why did you have to use, of all things, the definition of useless dross from the result of smelting ore to define your promiscuous women? I liked the original name. It made him sound industrial, like he was every bad thing taken away from a core product, and all we're left with is an ill-mannered entity, which is what he was. And instead, we're left with Slug, which rhymes with Doug, which is what I'm calling him now. Like, Slug is offensive to Slugs, and rather a friend Doug than Slugs, though I feel by doing this I'm just defending Doug and the Slugs. Doug is a Triceratops. Maybe I should call him Sarah? Nah, I just get confusing. Anyway, he's got a decent enough alt mode, though one I've had considerable trouble to line up just right. Regardless, his dinosaur mode articulation is awesome. It allowed me to do the walking animation, and that's all I can say about that. Robot mode is about everything you can expect. It's stylized, though the transformation and aesthetic scream that it's Doug, which is awesome. It's classic styled, so it'll fit in with your generations, and he's still got the big old dino toes. But everything about it is still G1-ish enough that it works. On to stage! Littlefoot here was a third member of the Dino crew. Unlike the third-party masterpiece attempts as of late, he actually has a bunch of ball joints in his neck, making for a Patasaurus mosh pit. Possibilities are endless. Robot mode is about the same story as Doug. Stylized enough to be his own thing, but G1-ish enough that everyone knows exactly what this is, no question. Which means we finally come to Grimlock the Sharp Tooth, and again, it's Sharp Tooth. There is no mistaking, this is Sharp Tooth. In fact, even when opening up the jaw, I have to use a tool like a screwdriver or something because the joint is stiff, those teeth are sharp, and I have baby soft skin. So here we have all four of the ones I've owned. They look downright fantastic together. They look primal, almost Cybertronian in there too. I really do love what Fans Project has pulled off here. Except they're kind of lacking someone to lead, in a way. Like some would say it's Grimlock, but that would make him a king. Well, if he is a king, why doesn't he look like it? And man oh man did Fans Project pull through here. Included with the deluxe version of Grimlock is a full on crown and throne for his loyal team members to come and do obeisance to him Grimlock King. So that's the Fans Project dinos. They are incredibly awesome. More awesome than I expected them to be. And I'm actually really happy to have owned them for a time. Lastly, we come to Titan's Return Megatron. This was a figure I don't think anyone expected. Much like the G2 Optimus that came to be, they were very obvious repaints of figures that were going to come later. That being Blitzwing and Octane. But I feel like they gave us Megatron and Optimus first because if it was reversed, those two would be shelf warmers because we got the molds. We got the figures we wanted those molds to be. Why would we want those two? And if that's the case, well, it worked. Everyone got Megatron and Optimus to get their first taste of the mold doubly so if you were a G2 fan, and everyone got Octane and Blitzwing because it's Oxbane and Blitzwing, why wouldn't you? Unfortunately, I'm not everyone. As much as I really, really wanted a Blitzwing, I never could find one. So I was happy to get the Megatron just to explore the mold, and what a mold indeed. Here we've started off in tank mode, and well, no, it's not perfect, as you can still see jet thrusters in the front, and the wings droop over the back like a blanket, I still feel this is an amazing tank for a triple changer. The shape has been nailed down amazingly, more so than whatever this heap of scrap was back in 2013, and in general, it's a tank. You'd be hard-pressed to guess this was anything else. Same can be said for jet mode. 
Well, yes, there's some treads visible, and yeah, the tank turret is down below pretending to be a landing gear. This is a solid jet that looks the part and looks doubly better than the former Blitzwing did as a tank mode does. And then we get to robot mode, and it's man, where is my Blitzwing? Yes, this makes for an amazing G2 nod of Megatron, more so than even the Combiner Wars leader Megatron did. This mode just screams Blitzwing. Of the triple changes that came out during Titan's Return, scratch that, of all the unit class durations triple changes that have ever come out, period, yes, that includes Springer, this is easily the most faithful to the source material and probably the best triple changer we've ever gotten, especially for a Blitzwing. Whew, it's been nearly 20 minutes of reviewing. We'll be right back while I get myself a drink. The Transformers will return after these messages. We now return to the Transformers. Right then, it's time for the remainder of the review. Yay! Hi everybody, and welcome to Intermission! In the Third Dimension! Is everybody ready? Do you all have your 3D glasses? <laughs> I don't think the audience got any 3D glasses. 3D glasses not available in all areas. Yep, that's right. The remainder of this review has been filmed in stereoscopic 3D. I actually had two cameras filming the whole review simultaneously, which means that every time I wanted to take a picture, I had to press capture twice on two different devices. Which means if you have a 3D TV, a VR headset, a Google Cardboard, or any other means that I don't know of of viewing 3D footage, I suggest if you're not already in the 3D version of this video, to go get your 3D device and enjoy the rest of this review. Righty then, let's get on with it, and we're going to start way back at the beginning and work our way to the present. This is my custom painted G1 Optimus Prime. It originally was a cab for a G1 Ultra Magnus reissue, but I wanted a Prime, so I would go with the paint. On this paint job, I've tried to stick as much as possible to a more cartoony appearance while incorporating some toy accuracy. Thus, the lack of yellow eyes, and why the shins are painted chrome. I also re-chromed everything that needed to be under the recommendation of Camzilla 51's chrome restoration tutorial. I highly recommend watching that. And as mentioned before, this was a Magnus reissue cab. But, I recently got an original one of those instead of the late 80s reissue, so let's bring that on out and compare. Yep, he certainly is a white optimist in every sense of the term. Though this version comes with actual plastic for the windows and rubber tires. How neat is that? Moving on to, surprisingly, a G1 character that could be one of my favorites, Brawn. Brawn is a mini-bot with, for whatever reason, massive amounts of torque packed into his little body. He could be seen stealing Megatron's blaster, straight up launching a Seeker, ramming his way through solid steel, and overall, being a real cool dude about it. So therefore I went and grabbed the G1 version, a MicroMaster rendition of a Land Rover Defender. And as far as G1 vehicles go, he's pretty cartoon accurate, I would say. Robot mode on the other hand... Yikes. I appreciate all the yellow coming out of nowhere to leaven up the robot mode, but man, that face. Those arms. Blech. Let's talk about a better G1 figure. This is Grapple. He is seen with Brawn because I don't have a hoist, and this is the best I got. Both Grapple and Inferno are both G1 figures I really enjoy. Their robot modes accurately depict the cartoons that drew them, they have a ton of arm articulation with big clumpy shoes to make a sturdy foot base, and a big old chest that says, Yeah, I'm a truck, how could you tell? Vehicle mode, on the other hand, is somewhat of a letdown. If it weren't for the arms, this would be a stellar truck. That being said, I have no idea why back then, the arms couldn't have folded into something a bit more compact, because, as is, they just kind of hang out on the side. Beyond that, though, the truck itself is awesome. Very Mitsubishi Fuso-inspired cab, telescoping crane boom, molded outriggers. This is an awesome crane! Finally, on to our last G1 figure, Hot Rod. This figure was given to me as a gift from Skull Kidding, and what a gift! Completely out of left field, it's something I never would have expected. Looking at the figure itself, I kind of understand why they wanted this toy to become the new leader in the 86 movie. He's already about Optimus's height, simple yet kinda cool transformation, Quite the face sculpt, flames, and this guy has it all. And it also makes sense now why toy versions keep making Hot Rod reddish maroon. Because this toy was. So when they make a reddish version, one that kids might actually pick up and ask their parents to buy, they're doing so because 
I highly doubt any kid would pick up a pinky purplish bot without knowing the source material. It's something I can understand and kind of get behind now. It's just a shame that the much, much cooler Ultra Magnus wasn't later. That would have been great to see. A guy who's just a soldier thinking himself unworthy, and then over the course of Season 3 becoming the leader Optimus was, and then some. He already just starts taking over leadership in Season 3 because Moby McWhiny Pants in the middle can't seem to ever want to step out of the shadow of Optimus and become his own thing. Though that being said, in Headmasters, mute the audio for like 20 seconds if you don't want to hear any spoilers. Don't worry, I'll signal you when I'm done. Are we muted? Alright then. I much preferred the way that the death of Optimus was handled for that show, and how Hot Rod became leader. Again. Japan just handled the torch passing so much better, and if that's how it was in the movie, I totally would have been fine with Hot Rod, provided of course he wasn't a whiny, Woe is me! I'll never be good as Optimus, little whiny baby. Alright, vehicle mode. And... Oh, would you look at that? For whatever reason, the Hot Rod toy reminds me of a Saturn SC1, like the early 90s version. Like you take the car, add some exhaust pipes, a big dumb spoiler, a flamey hood, color them headlights, and ta-da! It's just Hot Rod. I, I think I have a much better respect for this toy than I do for the character. I've really enjoyed the transformation. It didn't feel like they were trying to be super humanoid, look ma, no kibble with this guy. You can see where the car parts are, and it looks good for a Transformer, unlike the rest of them from this era, where Robot Mode did everything it could to hide the fact that it could be a vehicle. Alright then, Legends figures. So normally I don't get Legends figures, I'm not really a fan of their size, their articulation, or lack thereof, the needed size for their fists for 5mm things, that is if they have the ability to even hold accessories, not to mention they generally don't look too accurate to the source material. But man, are these guys on a different level! Here's Power Glide. Uh, you know what, forget that. Here's Power Glide, Cosmos, Brawn, and Spencer. And wowzers. Just what an amazing attempt to make G1 accurate characters of mini bots. Power Glide is his red A10 Thunderbolt. Something I'm surprised at how close they got to accuracy while not being pursued by Fairchild Republic. Cosmos in his green UFO alt mode, which looks so dang spot on you'd wonder what else could be done to improve it. Brawn, well, not a Land Rover, and well, fair enough on that. I'm not really expecting realistic vehicles from anything less than third parties and MPs. The rugged all-terrain vehicle that looks like it came straight out of spin tires he's rocking out sure hits all the right notes for me. Finally, Spensor in the back. At one time was Titan's Return Rewind, which, I do have to say, Legends Triple Changers? Now that's a feat of engineering right there. The tank mode is easily the most forgettable though, so we'll cover more on him and what makes him so special later. For now though, robot mode. Everything about Brawn is straight up amazing. I love how the yellow makes its triumphant return, how the silver fuel tanks become the arms, how we finally have an official Brawn toy that has the big old juggernaut noggin sitting pretty on top instead of that. We get to take the roof section of the vehicle and make an extra gun for him, not that he really ever used him. If you have the Titans Return Megatron, you can use the cannon to recreate the fire on the mountain scene where he hijacks the fusion cannon. In short, I was the most impressed by what they accomplished for Titans Return Brawn. He looks incredibly accurate, has an epic alt mode, and is jam-packed with personality and heft for being such a little guy. Power Glide not only looks incredibly faithful in vehicle mode, but transforms faithfully, and becomes an updated G1 robot mode as well. The wings are perched up into the shoulders, the tail is the feet, the engines are the arms. Basically everything about this figure is Power Glide. Another cool feature that I was never really able to cover in the Aerial Bots videos, because I never found this guy until very recently, was the fact that if you pull out his landing gear and half transform this guy, he too gets to be kind of a dumb triple changer. His third mode is definitely forced, like, heavily forced, but he ends up becoming a gun for Superion, bringing the team number count up to 7. I still find this kind of wonky in my opinion, so I'll just stick with the incredible guns Superion came with in the first place. Speaking of characters with guns, here's 2013's Cosmos, in bright green. I think this was when Legends figures started getting really, really good. They weren't so concerned with trying to cram Optimus into that tiny, tiny shape, or at least were starting not to, and began to shift focus to actually covering minibots. And man, oh man, does it ever work in their favor. Obviously stylized in the way that only generations can do, this is pretty much a 90% faithful recreation of Cosmos. And man, does that ever do it for me. Masterpieces are great and all, but when you're already hitting pretty much Cosmos for $12, why even bother? And look, he even comes with a little space shuttle guy that turns into a gun. I forgot to film it, 
but he too becomes a little guy that I've never heard of. Finally, we come to Spencer. Who is Spencer, you ask? He's that guy. This is a Titans Return Rewind with a Rapper Labels Convergence set applied. This set is called Spencer, as in short for Dispenser, and he is indeed the Mountain Dew Machine. If you're the sort that prefers Mountain Dew Code Red, well, they did make a Frumble Conversion set as well. So with the idea that he's the 2007 movie Mountain Dew Machine, that means he can only be one thing beyond some silly tank. Yes siree Bob, he is a Mountain Dew Machine. What's this? You want a refreshing beverage rich in vitamin sugar? No drink for you! These four are not the only legends I've got my hands on, though. Let's look at some gun-based ones. 2011 Legends Megatron and 2016's Combiner Wars Shockwave. And while Megatron doesn't come with his fictitious accessories, and Shockwave doesn't come with a silver attachment, these are both fantastic representations of their respective characters. My question is, though, who's mistaking this Legends class figure for a legit gun? Why the orange tip here? Like, what are you going to do? Walk into a convenience store at 2 a.m. with a 2.5 inch gun and actually pull off a heist? I found this silly, as did many. Regardless, it's still pretty awesome. Some may also have noted how I've removed some of the things from Shockwave, like feet and so forth. I did this mainly to make a more streamlined gun mode, though it does kind of ruin the robot a bit. Not enough to make it broken, just problematic is all. Let's jump into robot mode and take a look at that. So despite being roughly the same size in gun mode, man, does Megatron ever get dwarfed here. He is like a tiny little star. Set against the vast, colossal sky of Mother Russia. Ha! <laughs> as far as Megatron goes, I actually really enjoyed the head sculpt. The fact they made the gun barrel the arm cannon, I mean, that might be slightly inaccurate, but I think it's cool he even got an arm cannon in the first place. That's awesome! Shockwave definitely looking his part too, even down to the yellow eye that Fall of Cybertron casually forgot when making their toy. Something else Shockwave gets that Megatron didn't though, a 5mm handle for making it so Combiner Wars Bruticus can hold him. This is super stinking awesome. On the other hand, Megatron can't really be held by anyone, even Metroplex's issues. Except, I literally just found this out at the time of writing. Did you know Legends Megatron has been engineered in such a way that the Masterpiece Seeker Mold can hold him like an ace? This is amazing. It was definitely this era of Transformers on a retail level that was incredible. We truly were spoiled back six to eight years ago. In fact, let's cover that era some more, and I'll get into why. It's not just a nostalgia for... Oh my god, eight years now? Oh. Anyway, let's start things off with Hunt for the Decepticon Zoom. Uh, I mean, Sea Spray. Let's dive in. Sea Spray, though never appearing in the movie, gets his own movie reverse toy like a ton of the other characters did. Again, Hasbro just showing the love not just for the oodles and oodles of coin they could make, and did make, but for the medium as well. Sea Spray like the G1 self is a hovercraft, but this variant is also a vehicle transport worthy, or so the box pointed out, sea worthy hovercraft. Except, it sort of isn't? It's not like anything from that time period really fit the description. You got your deluxe chugs, your deluxe movies, about the only thing that even sort of fits is Masterpiece Mobile because you know the saying, everything scales, actually, what really fits the best are my HO scale vehicles. Seen here are Cliff Jumper and Mobile Another cool feature is the fans are completely versatile in their placement. Want them sucking in air like this? No problem. Rotate them around so that your power is centralized right dead center? Easy peasy. Or spread them as far as possible for even more power distribution at the sides? The possibilities are almost endless. Robot! Man, this sea spray is cool. I love how the whole bottom of the vehicle just contorts itself up into legs. How he has little flippers for feet. The cockpit just becomes his chest, and it looks super epic at that, and the fans' little shoulder ornaments. Basically, this sea spray hits the same beats that the G1 did in terms of where parts of him end up, while still making this alt mode and subsequently the robot mode his own thing. I really do enjoy this figure. Here's a bit of weird scaling for you. So going back to the HO scale car scale best vehicle mode. Here's what sea spray would have looked like against the likes of Megatron and Jazz if sea spray didn't mass shift. For evidence of would Megatron actually be that tall compared to an Autobot car? Yeah. Yeah, he would. But man, it's like, forget Superior on a Defensor. Just send Sea Spray out after Devastator. Would probably be a lot more effective to boot. Onwards to a figure I bought eight years ago and then gave to X Eagle One as a gift before I started the channel, and good gravy am I ever surprised he still had this. It's Revenge of the Fallen Dead End, a recoloring of Revenge of the Fallen Sideways. This guy is modeled after an Audi R8. At the time, it was one of our favorite cars, so we were super excited to see it as a Transformer. 
and not to mention, in a way cooler paint scheme than sideways. This is what I kinda miss about way back then. There was a huge focus, thanks in part to the movies having to use recognizable product placement, to make the Transformers based on real world vehicles, and thankfully it's something that the Masterpiece has taken over with vehicles from the 80s. I super love it when a Transformer actually becomes a real world accurate vehicle, doubly more so when it takes the time to be accurate, not just outside, but inside as well. Anyway, enough gushing over the time period. For now, let's transform. Man, what an epic transformation. I get some people's distaste when it gets too fiddly, but we just gotta stop for a second. This is a deluxe figure with some third-party masterpiece level engineering. That is amazing. Does he look accurate to the movie? I couldn't tell you. Dead End wasn't in the movie, and Sideways was in the movie for like, two minutes? And in robot mode for a total of seven seconds? Wow, good use of character, guys. Regardless, he looks super duper cool. The red just kind of exploded out of an otherwise predominantly black vehicle, and the whole aesthetic just really has it going on here. So how about the rest of the cast? I know I've talked about most of these before, but they're repaints. I loved these figures, and dang it, I will take any excuse I can to talk about them some more. So this is Desert Storm Ratchet. He came out during the Revenge of the Fallen era. He features some dusty panels, a faded paint job, and an otherwise just dull appearance. Aside from the ugly paint, he sure does look the part of the Hummer Ambulance. So I got a question. I am curious. Does the US actually have Hummer ambulances, or was this just made up for the sake of the movie? Every ambulance I've seen is this shape, except for Moncton, apparently. They seem to use Ford vans, just straight up vans. It's weird. What's also weird is this ripple effect paint job they threw on Ironhide. This is 2009's Recon Ironhide. This version is more than just a repaint though, as his bumper, which unfortunately is missing, can be removed. The door panels can fold away now, there's floodlights, roof racks, a headache rack, and if they weren't missing, man was he ever armed to the teeth this time. Like a combat knife, three guns, a bumper based crossbow attachment thing, recon my butt, this was the cavalry edition of Ironhide. Send in Bumblebee to do some recon, some scouting, get the lay of the land. Send Ironhide in as the one man army, cause man was this guy armed, armored, and ready to tear through some Decepticons. And then we finally get to Optimus. What's different about this Optimus? Well, nothing I haven't covered before, at least as far as the mold goes. Thanks to Camzilla 51's video covering the Molotov liquid chrome pen, as well as an aluminum malt straw, I've given Revenge of the Fallen Optimus Prime here a shiny makeover. So what have I picked out in chrome? The entirety of the front, save for the actual headlights, which I left in their clear plastic. I also left the gap between the light fixture and the bumper unpainted. In the end, I wanted to cut away some of that gap, as in reality, those headlights are supposed to be fixed to the fenders, so I wanted to cut away some of the plastic to give the appearance they were floating. Unfortunately, I didn't get that far in the modification process. On the sides, the oil tanks, the fuel tanks, the running light array, which was also supposed to have amber paint to pick out the running light details, but again, never got to it, the side view mirrors, the chrome trimmer on the sleeper cab door, the panel on the back of the sleeper has been picked out in chrome to make it stand out more. I was considering finding something to replicate air brake hoses like pipe cleaner or springs, but decided against it for the sake of robot mode. The taillights were all clear plastic and thankfully was see-through on both sides, so I chromed the bumper out and painted the interior side of the plastic red to give it a more realistic red with glass overlay look. The sun visors have been chromed out as well as more running lights. And finally, the part I am the most proud of. Gone are the rubbery garbage plastic that was calling themselves the upper part of the smokestacks. Those have actually been cut away. What it has been replaced with is an aluminum malt straw that I have been cut down to size and then fit over the soft rubber and silicone glued into place. They're permanently attached and also give an incredible realistic smokestack look without being flippy floppy. For an extra touch of realism, I took the tips to a bench grinder and ground them down to the correct angle. How is this extra realistic you may ask? Well, the heat from the friction of doing said action has discolored the tips, giving them a slightly burnt appearance, much like you'd see on the smokestacks of a real truck. Basically, this was an extensive mod to an already fantastic toy that I cannot say enough how proud of it I am. Everybody is going on about the new Masterpiece Movie Prime? Well, this is my take. This truck mode is perfect, and something Movie Masterpiece will never, ever get right. Robot Modes You know, I kind of forgot how odd Ratchet was as a Voyager figure. His articulation is kind of wonky. His proportions are a bit weird. He's a real chunky dude, which oddly enough is not how the movie had him on screen. He wasn't a small guy by any means, but he did have somewhat of a slender build. I think this could have been fixed had the Humvee ambulance been hollow on the inside and it had been a panel former, kind of like Dead End is, and to some extent Ironhide. Regardless, I still like the chunk of the figure. 
it's just a shame that of the two Voyager figures, he's kind of the weaker one. I am eager to see, though, if Hasbro will tackle this in their movie Masterpiece line. They've already done this with Optimus, Ironhide, and Bumblebee, and Ratchet did get a studio series, but for Masterpiece, all they need to do is Jazz and Ratchet, and you'd have your original crew. Speaking of Ironhide, Recon Ironhide. Yep, still looking as awesome as ever. The arm cannons have been shrunk down a bit to make room for the other weapons, and that's actually kind of nice compared to the original. I still love the way Ironhide was designed, especially the way the legs automorph into the robotic grill fest they are down there. They went from solid truck bed to robotic leg. Yes, this black truck certainly is a wonder of engineering. Hey, wait a minute. Black truck, you say? Huh. So who else in G1 do we know that's a black truck? I do wonder if Hasbro was originally going to go with Trailbreaker in the movie, much like how Brawl was called Devastator for some reason. And I don't just mean for the sake of, well, he's a black truck, so, you know, he must be a black truck. G1 all the way. Like, you know how everyone got themselves a G1 color redeco back in the movie era? Optimus had his colors flipped, B was already B, Ratchet got white with a red EKG symbol, and Jazz got his martini livery. Ironhide, on the other hand, went from black to blue, not unlike a certain Diaclone toy. I don't know. My theory is that Ironhide was probably going to be Trailbreaker, and considering that Ratchet and Ironhide usually share the same mold for most of the continuities, having Trailbreaker show up as the GMC top kick would have been awesome. Finally, my custom Optimus. Aside from the truck bits still visible that make their chrome appearance here, I've also chromed out the headlights and his abs attached to the truck firewall, just to pick out the headlights and the fact that they faux transform themselves there, unlike the Masterpiece version which actually does have the headlights end up there. Credit where credit was due, I was impressed by that. I still marvel at this leader class toy with Masterpiece Engineering sold for 60 bucks at the time. It truly is a sight to behold with how everything was designed. It's faithful to the source material, complex enough that it gives the brain a run for its money, and is just... Wow! I cannot gush over this figure enough. Before time began, there was... The Cube. We know not where it comes from, only that it holds the power to confuse worlds and fill them with puzzles. That is how our race was born. For a time, we lived in harmony, but like all great puzzles, some wanted it for good, others for evil. And so began the war, a war that ravaged our world until it was consumed by death, and the cube was thrown to the far reaches of space. We scattered across the galaxy, hoping to find it and finally solve it once and for all, searching every star, every world. And just when an all hope seemed lost, message of a new discovery led us to an unknown planet called Earth. Well, enough of that then. Let's go from the height of its time to the worst of its line. Revenge of the Fallen, stinking Devastator. Ooh, Devastator. So what can be said about Revenge of the Fallen, Devastator that hasn't already been said? We have a tiny earth mover, a gigantic cement mixer, and some other stuff in between. Ugh, it's just... it's so weird. Like, what actually is in scale with each other? Scavenger and Mixmaster? Sorta. Bone Crusher and Scrapper? I, I guess so. And finally, Hightower and Long Haul, I suppose. But altogether, it's just super weird looking. And the odd thing is, the Legends class figure didn't even have this issue, and it had robot modes for all of them to boot. How is it that you can spend, what was it, $30, and get an infinitely better version of whatever this lump of plastic was at 120 and we haven't even gotten to Devastator yet? So Bone Crusher and Long Haul can torque themselves into legs, High Tower and Scrapper into arms, I guess. I don't know, I think that's even a stretch. Appendages, sure. Mixmaster pretends he can change his color. Okay, let's stop right there for a sec. The movie's intent isn't just to tell a story, but also to generate toy sales for kids, right? So why on earth would Devastator's head become red from a gray cement truck in the movie? Does Michael Bay just have no respect for the work the toy... Oh, that's probably it, isn't it? Anyway, Mixmaster gets red rabbit ears, and then his base falls down and around, and finally, Scavenger contorts himself into a torso. After that, it's a matter of legs, torso, other unverified limbs, and then a head. And... a devastator. And the appearance is devastating, and not in a good way. This thing is just so... 
ugly. And this coming from a guy that kind of enjoys what the movie aesthetics were for the first three movies, back when they weren't trying to hide the fact that they were made from cars. Like, this is cool. This is very much not cool. The box showed him to be a biped, the movie had him as a quadruped, so with some finagling, a quadruped he is. I don't know what to say about this guy. We used to think he was huge, and then Metroplex and Forts Max came out. We used to think this was the best combine we were going to get that was this size. And then Combiner Wars and Fall of Cybertron happened. And in general, this thing is just a tragedy of engineering. Sad too, considering how incredible everything else was that Hasbro was making at the time. When plastic was cheap, and the engineers gave two cents into what they were making, and they weren't bogged down by endless complaints from parents of, Well, Johnny couldn't figure it out, and for that matter, neither could I. For the scale, I am also surprised that scale is so off. Ah, wait a minute, I'm not surprised. The scale is wrong for other figures like this deluxe sideswipe. I thought he was supposed to be able to eat these things. Well, onwards then to sideswipe. Though let's talk about the Human Alliance version. Another figure X Eagle 1 had and still has from when he bought it on clearance all that time ago. This figure came with Sergeant Epps. Though, I have no clue, and for that matter, neither does he, of where that got off to. What's awesome about Sideswipe, you may ask? Well, he's a concept Corvette Stingray that sadly never came to fruition, but instead the Corvette C7 did. Which the C7 is not a bad car in its own right. It is what Crosshairs became after all, but this Stingray concept... Dang, what a ride this was and could have been. In general, movie Sideswipe is the only way to get a model of this car, aside from a Hot Wheels version that was also released. Which, in part, is why I'm looking at the Human Alliance version rather than the Deluxe version, which I also have. Because I am incredibly impressed by the intention to detail that took on these doors. Look, sister doors, just like the concept had, that's awesome. And the interior, oh man, mwah, that's amazing. Quick question though, does Sideswipe ever just scream tracks to anyone else? Like, could they have just named the thing tracks and called it a day, much like Trailbreaker and Ironhide could have been? I think this was supposed to be tracks from a toy perspective, but maybe changed to Sideswipe for reasons of, eh, that's a name people would recognize, right? Like, it even had a red repaint, and it wasn't called Sideswipe G1 Repaint. No, it was Swerve. But you could honestly throw the name Road Rage on there, and no one would even blink. You know what else I think is amazing? That Human Alliance scales near perfect with Alternators 2. So, here we go. The C5 Corvette parked next to the Corvette Centennial Concept. Beautiful. On the robot side of things, we get kind of a weird thing going on with the Human Alliance. Well, I love the extra support the figure has for balancing the feet, and simultaneously making the rollerblade wheels more accurate, the Deluxe is where I find the better robot mode is, believe it or not. Sure, the feet aren't quite as accurate, but the back sure is. It's not just the whole car hanging off the back saying, yo, what's up? I'm the body shell of a Corvette. The Deluxe has the rear window as the back paneling, and the hood has folded itself up into adjustable wings. Quite frankly, I can also live with the inaccurate front fenders, as they look stellar. Well, since we're on a Corvette binge, let's jump on over to the g one side of things. Here's Alternators, Masterpiece, and Hen K Tracks. And boy, oh boy, look at all that blue. One thing that everyone who reviews Tracks seems to make mention of, if not complain about it, is the fact that the Masterpiece doesn't have the high-gloss, deep blue the Hen K version has going for it. Don't get me wrong, the Hen K has an exquisite shade of deep blue that is super glossy against the bold colors of a flamed-out hood. It's breathtaking. I'm super glad I broke down one day and bought it because it kind of is a privilege to behold it in person. Where, where was I going? Oh, right, Masterpiece. No, it's not the Hen K paint scheme. What is it then? Since Masterpiece Tracks is a fully licensed Chevrolet product, this therefore comes in a gorgeous stock Le Mans blue. The shade of blue on the Masterpiece wasn't made up. This is legitimately the color of blue used on the 1982 Corvette C3. It is Fabulous, and I am deeply impressed by the level of attention Takara took in applying this shade to the Masterpiece. Compared to the flat blue of the Alternators version, the metallic sheen and fleck on the Masterpiece is just jaw-dropping. Goodness, if the persona of Trax's character materialized itself and read the script or heard this review, could an ego get any bigger? Suffice it to say, I'm in love with this blue, Takara did an excellent job, and I have no idea what more could be said beyond amazing job, Takara! On the paint, there are actually a few issues I have with this figure as a whole. The Alternator C5 does have its doors open, that's obvious, but its hood opens up backwards like the actual C5. This was impressive to me. Also impressive was opening up said hood showcased the prime of the Chevrolet options, the LS3 V8 engine, which also became the gun. How incredible is that fact? The Masterpiece on the other hand, oh, 
The hood opens from the front. Why? And not only that, but the design inside isn't even of the C3 engine bay. Nah, it's the engine bay as the artist drew it for the Make Tracks episode. At least I think it was Make Tracks. Basically, the episode where Raul cuts his wire and he can't talk or be a robot and yada yada yada. The engine bay and the masterpiece disappointed me to say the least. The hood is backwards and the engine is based off a cartoonist idea of what an engine might look like, because gotta have them tune references, you know? Speaking of Raul, he comes with a masterpiece, except he's not poseable like every other figure has been so far. Again, I ask, why? So here's a cool thing. The masterpiece gets flight mode. Awesome. It's the flying car of the future today. And while well, the accuracy of detail from the cartoon is ever present here with the arm vents and the wheels up top and the tail fins and the wings and so forth. Throw in that flight stand and he is in permanent flight mode. That too is stinking awesome. So lastly, we come to roll up mode and... Huh. What happened? The arms are super lanky and can barely even go 90 degrees. The legs are the same way. The knees are the same way. The shoulders are kind of wonky in their movement. In general, it's like, what even is this? It's like all that was focused on was it looking good and everything else is kind of... Oh, <laughs> I see what you did here, Takara. This toy is a metaphor for who Trax really was, wasn't it? All show and no substance. Good for almost nothing except flying and looking absolutely fabulous doing it. I mean, look at this. I'm trying to do the whole knee bent while stabilizing arm placement thing, and it just... It just doesn't work. But he looks stellar doing it. Ugh, that was a lot of Transformers. So for now, let's take a short detour and cover some other figures I have. Now, I know I already covered Figma Samus, but not this one. The other M Samus I had, I kept for a long while, just for the love of the character, but I was never ever happy with it and intended to do a complete overhaul mod to update the figure. And then the Prime 3 Corruption model was announced, and literally the next day, I had the Figma Samus sold. Because man, that thing just looked lame. This Samus, on the other hand, oh, she is a thing of beauty. Sadly, I did prefer the orange and the other end variant, but the goldish bronze of the Corruption suit is game accurate, and it took like two days for it to grow on me. And to be fair, it does look fantastic. So considering I no longer have the other M. Samus, or Samus as everyone keeps yelling at me to say, I still want to do a comparison, so let's use the Smash Bros. Amiibo that I painted into a gravity suit. The comparison between these two toys embodies everything different between how Retro Studios completely and totally respected Samus as a character, whereas Sakamoto kinda, well, didn't. Everything about the corruption suit is chunky and beefy, and as far as the aesthetics go, are completely faithful to the original various suit that Gunpei Yokoi set out as the suit upgrade for both Metroid 2 and Super Metroid. Sakamoto Samus, on the other hand, looks smooth, over-the-top feminine, delicate, and so on. Retro Studios, and by extension Yokoi Samus, is bulky while also being athletic, powerful, commanding, and is just a great design through and through, not unlike the way Marvel's Iron Man was designed. And that was the problem with Other M. All Sakamoto did in that game was make Samus as weak as possible to force Adam Malkovich as the supposed fantastic character that in the end was super abusive and we're supposed to feel like that's a great thing? Samus is best not in the Adam Malkovich relationship, but in the Admiral Dane relationship, who honestly would have made a way better Malkovich. Like, hear me out for a sec. Imagine a different outcome where the only difference to corruption is Admiral Dane is just renamed to Malkovich, and he sacrifices himself in some way so that Samus can gain access to Planet Phase. We don't get any more backstory to the character or anything, just his appearance in that game. Corruption would then be setting up the whole relationship of respect that was described in Fusion, and then, if you wanted to do a backstory like Other M attempted to do, set it before the events of First Metroid of how they met and so on. Just, for goodness sakes, please, anything but the abusive daddy and the weak and powerless surrogate daughter. It's... it's really bad. Alright then, here's a toy from Jack Specific that compliments Samus fantastically. A generic Metroid. Now one would say, that's not to scale! Is it? Is it really not to scale? Now all we need is a mother brain of this caliber, and are ready to start scene recreating. A Ridley of this scale would also be insanely awesome, but let's not get too carried away. The baby Metroid here has four articulated mandibles with soft, rubbery, greenish membrane, and four visible nuclei. I am truly impressed that Nintendo would even greenlight something like this to be made, and put into a kid store. It's a jellyfish-looking thing with sharp claws that latches on and sucks the living energy out of you until you're just a husk of a human being. Well, since we mentioned Iron Man earlier, let's cover an incredible Lego set, the Hulkbuster. 
A well-articulated Lego suit, I was super happy to have this set that was actually designed to have the Iron Man minifigure jump inside and pilot the thing. And look at that, striking an epic pose of determination. At one time, I had planned to do a Lego Avengers vs. the Decepticon skit, but I never really got past the concept footage of the Hulkbuster powering up, and I lost the footage, so I can't even show you that, which... kinda sucks. Oh well, another unfinished idea that'll never come to fruition. Ugh. It's been what? Almost an hour now? Well, I'm gonna get another drink. We'll be right back after these messages. The Transformers will return after these messages. We now return to the Transformers. Alrighty, after that short break of not Transformers, let's jump back into another masterpiece I've been saying I'll cover for who knows how long at this point. Ironhide! Ironhide, much like Ratchet that I covered in the review 86, is a Nissan Cherry Vanette. Except, he's actually Cherry this time. Well, almost. He's kind of more like a fire engine red, though Nissan themselves will tell you that's actually active red, and it features the three-tone striping running down the side of the van. Also, like I covered in the Ratchet review, that's a ridiculous amount of panel lines all over this vehicle, and one that the Shadow Fisher upgrades provides right here. Aside from the extra panel line, I still do wonder why we all give this thing a pass. There's just so many lines! And the only reason I was even okay with adding another one to the vehicle mode was to correct an issue in robot mode. Aside from my complaints and the ludicrous amount of panel lines, I do quite like the alt mode, just the big ol' minivan that is Ironhide. There is no mistaking it, this is so much Ironhide. In bot mode, things are a different story. The Shadow Fisher upgrades help make an easier transition visually in terms of making the chest look more like a front of a van during the animation, and in general, there is no mistaking that his cuboid pot-bellied red guy is Ironhide. And where Ratchet had his med sled, Ironhide also gets himself an accessory tray. And I asked in the Ratchet comments what we should call this thing, and the majority, and I'm included in that majority as I agree to the suggestion, has ruled this shall be called the Lead Sled. So yeah, Ironhide's guessed just as many accessories bundled that Ratchet did, and almost as many as the Eye Gear counterparts also had, all of which I've had so much fun with. First off, you get two pistols as seen in the movie, a static gun thing that came with the original toy, and a back-mounted missile launcher that you can pivot to one side and have War Machine up the place. Retracting his hand reveals this little tab, which makes for a whole bunch of accessory shenanigans. Hello, you cooking fans. Welcome to my cooking show. Unfortunately, that jerk of a health inspector got my show cancelled after discovering an insect infestation. So, I'm not allowed to call my show... In fact, I'm not even allowed to say... So, since I don't have a network to worry about anymore, I can be a little more liberal with what I can make here. So the first thing we're going to make today is iron stew. And the first ingredient we need is obviously iron. So, grab your nearest Autobot that has iron in the what name. The I mean, it's not just the name. He literally we're has an iron hide. Those with weak fuel tanks should probably look away. Alright now, we need to pull out our knife. Uh, you're going to want to hold still for this. Too. If so you square my knife, take off more than your hand. Okay. And then we go... There. We have ourselves some iron. We'll be right back after I get this whiner to the med bay. And that class is how to hit two Decepticon SUVs head-on at once. Any questions? Yes, Ironhide? Is class dismissed? Rock, Rock paper, paper, scissors. scissors. Ha! G1 wins once and for all. Violence. It's fantastic. Your time is up, Megatron. <laughs> what the? Whose mess is this? Oh, uh, sorry, Ironhide. That's mine. Could you clean that up for me? <sighs> Promise, it's like I think I'm a maid around here. It's not one thing, it's another. There. Spick and span. Hey, uh, Ironhide, uh, could you come here a minute? <sighs> Another cool thing he has that Ratchet didn't get was his jetpack. He used this, like, twice, after all the Autobots forgot how to fly after the pilot episode. He also comes with two flames to pop into those jets for some active flying scenes. But that's not all you can do with it. Get ready for some really immature potty humor. That's right. Using the 3mm peg, you can place it in any compatible hole. Therefore, we can shock an Apollo Inferno with rocket farts. Wait a second. 
Did I say three millimeters? I sure did. That also means Trax is compatible with some immaturity, and even Samus, or anything else from Fate. Being that the flame worked in the 3mm port, this also means that the screw hole on the bottom of Ironhide's butt is flight stand compatible. So throw on that rocket pack and take a leisurely flight with your buddy Trax. Well that's enough of a Red Voyager class masterpiece. On then to Inferno, a Voyager class masterpiece figure. I haven't done that in like, what, 6 seconds now? Inferno, so nicely decked out in repro labels, is the fire engine guy from season 2. He is also part of the Masterpiece line that is slowly, but surely, pulling away from a focus of realism and toy accuracy and focusing more and more on tune accuracy. This is, what I've mentioned countless times before, bothering me. Thus, why I'm quite happy for the repro labels, cause DANG, what a blank canvas Toy Hacks had to work with here. Look at all this boring, empty space. Thus, so much in terms of toy accurate labeling was added to the head, shoulders, knees and toes, and so on, that just makes it actually interesting to look at. I quite like what they've done here, long story short. And well, since we're on the subject of choices for this figure, let's take a look at options for display. Two different helmets, one modeled after how he was in the cartoon sometimes, and the other modeled after how he was in the cartoon the other times, and the toy, and these were done in a really stupid way. Each helmet only gets two faceplates. Rather than designing the helmet to accommodate one faceplate design to add more variety, so you end up getting four faceplates to go with the two helmets. A neutral face for each helmet, and a happy face for one helmet, and a grimace face for the other. So what if you like the head spires and want them laughing? Or you like the one helmet with little bear ears and want a grimace? What if you just wanted a fourth face design instead of two neutrals? All of this and more could have been solved had they just made the helmets interchangeable. Regardless, with either head you pick, the shoulder cannon still works and features compatibility with the water spray attachment. Another option that a lot of people seem to have enjoyed, and well good for them, is a cartoon accurate front grille and headlights. Remember that Mitsubishi logo proudly printed on the front? Pah! Who cares about that, am I right? Yep, just pop the vehicle accurate chest plate off and you have yourself every excuse Takara could have used to ignore getting a license for the vehicle use. Why go through all that trouble to get a Mitsubishi approved if you're just going to pull it off anyway? And finally, a third option, a bracket chest plate. This was designed to hold Red Alert, in reference to that one episode where he caught Red Alert at the end of the episode. But really, any 2013 Lamborghini mold will fit. This attachment is great though if you want to carry old Red across the threshold after the ceremony. Another thing he gets is a fire hose, which is cool if you don't think too hard about it. Like, why the hose? It's not like he doesn't have the ability to shoulder cannon the water, or fire the water out of his hand detachment. Oh well, he has the hose regardless. Heel Commode. Here he is in a Mitsubishi Fuso fire truck. And I think it's cool that for a time, I did have a transformer that turned into a Mitsubishi product. Even if it was nothing even remotely close to my car, oh well. Dreams of Autobot Awesome Something and his bright blue Lancer mode will forever be longed for. So Inferno. Inferno is more a testament that Takara was really, really focusing on the cartoon. About the only thing remotely related to the Mitsubishi fire truck is the cab and the wheel configuration. Everything else but this vehicle mode is pretty much just cartoon aesthetically based. And that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Like, look at how much effort Mastermind Creations put in to make the vehicle look absolutely stellar. When you look at this vehicle, your immediate thought isn't, Oh hey, there's a bunch of arms in the bed of this fire truck. It's, Oh hey, a scale model Fuso fire truck. And that is what Masterpiece meant to me. And I know I sound like a broken record, and still will for a bit, but... Masterpiece meant cartoonish appearance emerging from a real-world accurate design. And if you still don't agree, allow me to make this other case. The whole motto is, Robots in Disguise. If you saw this on the road, would you not think it weird that a bunch of arms were hanging out of this fire truck? Would you not think it weird that this Fire Chief Lambo had grayed out headlights? I don't know, guys. It's been really bugging me the direction they took the Masterpiece line. I know to some, it's a fantastic thing, because they want their figures to step out of the cartoon right off the TV almost, because they also have no interest in cars, or vehicles as a whole, or scale modeling, and therefore know incredibly little about what the Autobots are actually turning into, so long as it turns into something close to it. Half the time it just feels like their review is, and here is Masterpiece Tracks. Here's a blue Corvette. I know that, because that's what the box says. But I care, and I matter to me. To you, I'm you, but to me, I'm me, and to me, I matter. Well, I don't really know what else to say about Inferno. He's easily the one figure I had in vehicle mode the least. Everyone else, I left them in vehicle mode occasionally because of how good they looked. But Inferno was just... eh, in vehicle. 
And same goes for Grapple. The two of them are clearly figures they designed for the cartoon purist who doesn't give two cents about what they turn into so long as it does it for some arbitrary reason. That I'll never understand. There are people out there who insist it must transform but will never do it because they don't like the vehicle mode and prefer robot mode. Perfect example, Megatron. How many of you have never even transformed Megatron once? I suggested once back when Next Transbox hadn't even announced Apollyon that maybe Takara just had to make a masterpiece Megatron that didn't transform to get her on the gun law while also providing a mini handheld Megatron like Soundwave have but revised so that every masterpiece figure could hold it. And you would not believe the backlash I got from a lot of people that's, no, it has to transform, otherwise it's not a transformer. So congratulations, everybody. We all got a Megatron that does indeed transform, that people in Australia have a hard time getting their hands on, and that we all had to pay $220 US for, and 90% of people never transform it because it's either too hard or they only care about robot mode. The logic of the fans of the thing baffle me. Well, since we're talking about Decepticons, how about we talk about those for a sec? This is Bad Cube's take on Masterpiece Insecticons, and personally, my preferred take on Masterpiece Insecticons. These ones are faithful to the cartoon aesthetic, which, in this case, considering they're based on robotic buds that have no real basis for what they should turn into, is actually a good thing in my books. They're all short and stocky, with beautifully chromed out red visors, and in general, totally suit the Masterpiece name brand they're trying very, very hard to blend in with. All three come with guns based on the short appearances they had in the cartoon, bombshells shooting Cerebral Trip or whatever, Kickback who wants everyone to say hello to his little friend, and Shrapnel, responsible for kicking off the MCU. The cowards have hidden from us. We're not for long. as well as three Energon cubes made of gummy plastic that has some tack to it. Perfect props for all your energy drunk Decepticons. Hey, 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 remember that time I had Optimus head in my hands and I was like, I'm gonna turn you into a Crocodimus Prime. And then I used his arm to shoot Bumblebee. Ah, <laughs> And now on to bug modes. Yep, those are bug modes. We got ourselves Kickback, Shrapnel, and Bombshell whose chest is turned into purple from black. I found this downright impressive, going from tune accurate black in robot mode to a tune accurate purple in bug mode, just by hiding an extra chest covering in the legs that fold over and form fit when in bug mode. Other than that, there's not really much else to say about the bug modes aside from the fact that I only bought them for one reason, so I can make the following short. Yeah, I really did fork out $150 just for a 30 second joke. Megatron, you've got to transform. I'll transform you all to molecules of melted matter! Bumblebee, I need you to walk me through Megatron's transformation. Alright, Optimus, I'm just pulling it up now. Optimus, 20 seconds until explosion! Hurry, Bumblebee! Okay, the first thing you need to do is move his head up, then take his chest, unpeg the whole thing, and move it over his head. 15 seconds! After that, unpeg the crotch piece. When that's done, you need to take the tank treads. Tank treads? What? This is leader class Megatron, right? Bumblebee, I need the instructions for Masterpiece Megatron. I'm sorry. I typed in leader Megatron instructions and that's what came up. Bumblebee, we don't have this kind of time. Hurry, we only have... Ten seconds left! Okay, I found it. Okay, you need to rotate his chest piece. Bombshell, prepare to become one Titan's Return Galvatron had a ton of potential. He's the right shape of body, and this is since he's the right shade of purple, they even have a really kickin' cannon. But unfortunately, he came out during Titan's Return, and dang, we gotta shove them headmasters in as many possible places as we can, right? 
As such, he comes with an unconvincing scuba mask that makes his head locked in one place, highly annoying, and his arm cannon has only one spot for it. Like I said, this guy had a ton of potential, only for it to be completely wasted because Headmaster's got a Headmaster. Toy Hacks helped solve this by offering a G1-inspired plastic helmet assembly, and it made the figure, like, miles better. Like, instant improvement right off the bat. Fun fact, I also owned the Takara Legends version, but wasn't crazy about the Lavender guy was rocking out, and much preferred the Deep Purple the rest of the world got for Hasbro. So, let's turn this guy into his only other mode. And look at that! His turn mode is even G1 faithful. But Lazy Eyebrow, what about a third mode? I don't know, guys. Do you see a cockpit? Do you guys see a potential for a third mode that we could cram the rest of his body into? No? Well, funny that, neither do I. Moving on to a review that's long overdue. This is an actually fantastic deluxe Megatron. Probably the best deluxe Megatron you could ever own. This is the best deluxe sound weight you could ever own. The best Optimus in deluxe size. And while not the best Bumblebee in deluxe, he is still fantastic. Yes, these are the four characters that came out when War for Cybertron first became a game. They were a figure I've wanted to talk about for years, but never did for some reason or another. I've wanted to do reviews on them since Review 10, and the only one I ever got around to doing was a really, really awkward crossover episode with Venom Sierra, the guy who owned the Takara United version of Soundwave with the chromed out purple. To our credit, we had pulled an all-nighter the night before when we filmed and wrote the review. Like... We were working an overnight security shift one day, and then afterwards we filmed it, wrote it, and recorded that review. So, the final recording you ended up hearing was like 5 or 6 in the morning after being up the whole day prior. And then after that, I just never got around to reviewing another War for Cybertron figure again, despite having the Rage of Cybertron 3-pack for years upon years. But, forget that. Thanks to X Eagle one actually owning the originals, now I am. War for Cybertron figures came out when the designers actually seemed to want to make engaging puzzles that weren't for five-year-olds that couldn't think for themselves. This was during a time when Transformers on a retail level I found were at its peak. We had great figures from the Revenge of the Fallen lineup, a lot of which weren't even in the movie. Drift came out during this time. Uniclacerations was in full swing, at this point going into the name Generations. Just, man, what a time to be a Transformers fan. So the first figure we're going to look at is Megatron. Megatron in its game accurate gray and hints of red. Referencing G1 of course, but still holding out to its own design, and I quite love it for that. He's still got the bucket head design, a massive fusion cannon, something other tank former Megatrons would never quite get right after this, these wicked knee spikes, expressive conversation hands that aren't bogged down by 5mm peg holes, cause it's not like Megatron needs to hold anything since his weapon is arm mounted. Everything about this figure screams Megatron, but it's still its own thing, and that makes it awesome. And then you pop it into tank mode, and this thing just bleeds excellence. Like, look at this mess. There's excellence all over the floor now. Can I get a mop? But seriously, though, check out this game-accurate tank. And we're not having to worry about how the legs are supposed to be tank treads, or the chest at the front of the tank, or anything. What's super cool is the arms split apart and become the treads, which can also fold away if you desire a more game-accurate hover tank. Though it kind of looks a little weird. Those knee spikes ended up becoming really stylish rear fins, and they really do look excellent. Basically, everything about this space tank is amazing, and I really, really love that Megatron is a tank. And thankfully, an incredible looking one, both in tank and robot mode. This is just... Man, even as a deluxe standalone Megatron... Even just ignoring the source material for a second, this is a fantastic figure that I highly recommend owning just for the sake of Megatron. This figure is great! Moving on then to War for Cybertron figure I felt was somewhat the weakest if we had to rank them. Soundwave. And by weakest, by no means am I suggesting this figure's bad. He just wasn't my favorite of the four, technically five, figures that came from this small line. Like, he looks the part, there's no denying this is Soundwave, and really, as far as deluxe sound waves go, unless you hunt down the elusive music label one that's slightly oversized anyway, this kind of was your best option, much like Megatron was. There's just something about him that's always struck me as off. I've never really been a fan of the super high shoulder spikes, the waist claws kind of rub me the wrong way, and for claws, that's not the best thing in the world to be rubbing you the wrong way. And then the van kibble on his legs is a little unsightly, but simultaneously unavoidable. Like, he's still a great sound wave, don't get me wrong, it's just... Not quite my thing. Now he does have an official mode, and we'll get to it, but first let's jump into his fan mode. 
position everything just right, and we sort of get a tape player. And it's not like Soundwave had never turned into this thing during Warp of Cybertron or Fall of Cybertron, so this doubly works. You get your wheels for speakers, the chest grill still looks like it's an itty bitty tape deck, and waist claws could pass off for play stop and record buttons. All in all, this is a wonderful fan created idea for the deluxe Soundwave figure. And now on to official mode. Yes, Soundwave turns into this... minivan, I guess? I think I'm just more surprised this wasn't retooled back then to be Ironhide or Ratchet. It's a very easy conversion to do. Like, check out this attempt from user Xavier Cal on TFW2005. This is awesome work and goes to show easily it could have been done to give us a few more characters from the beloved video game of the day. Just take out them belly claws, give that sound of a grey, black, and red paint job, and we're off to the repaintable races. Speaking of repaints, Bumblebee! Bumblebee was an interesting figure from this line. If we're counting all four as around the same in-game height, then Bumblebee is a giant and it really shows in the alt mode. Otherwise, here we have an amazing figure. Sort of. There are certainly amazing things about him, things I'll cover in just a minute, but that doesn't escape the fact that he's a shell former. And when we go to transform, all we'll really be doing is crumbling the robot into a lump and then covering over that with a nice vehicular looking tarp. So then what makes this guy awesome? Well, how about the slick engineering showcasing the ankles? The wheels are actually housed inside the legs and are nestled amongst a bunch of robot parts that looks very streamlined. This is easily my favorite part about this figure, and I know that the Masterpiece Hobie Bumblebee recently did this, and I was just as impressed with that as I am with this. It's aesthetically accurate, it's aesthetically pleasing, and I really do wish more figures had done this. Especially that sorry excuse for a Jazz. Which also means that Bumblebee's front wheels actually become his forearms as well. Look at that. Two for two on the accuracy for the figure that came out before this abysmal piece of trash did. Oh, fall of Cybertron Jazz. You disappoint me. And 3-on-3 three three for accuracy is the flip-out sword for when you go for that melee attack in game by pressing down your thumbstick. They really went all out for the bee's knees here. Vehicle mode. Moby transforms into a plastic lump that fits inside a car-shaped shell. What exactly was robot mode before we hit vehicle? Well, this cup shape. Everything else is shell. Which, now that I mention it, probably would have made for a good cup retooling had he been in-game. But he wasn't, so, oh well. My over-exaggerations aside, this is a faithful adaptation of the little mini-car that made probably the most annoying engine sound in game. And aside from the lack of wings, it's not all that far off in terms of G1 Cybertron cartoon accuracy as well, oddly enough. And yes, he is the only figure that got a repaint, not counting the Rage of Cybertron set. That means a cliff jumper was totally available for purchase if you so desired to pick that up. So that leaves but one left, that being Optimus. War for Cybertron Optimus is a marvel of engineering. The figure that small kids couldn't figure out and parents with no interest in Transformers got frustrated with. This figure has almost zero faux parts, and yet parts still end up in nearly impossible places. Like in vehicle mode, the smokestack on the legs need to end up near the shoulders. The wheels in the calves need to end up on the bottom. The shoulders become fenders for wheels that are currently on his back. That ab ribbing needs to disappear and the waist fenders still need to be there. The knees need to become bumpers. If this figure was designed today, you'd more than likely see the likes of Age of Extinction Optimus with just a shell former syndrome, but no. The designers looked at the source material, looked at their computers, and said, we can make this happen. And happen it did. But first, a look at the robot mode. Pictured here is the noble leader of the Autobots as seen in his Cybertron form. The proportions are just right for his heroic stature, their colors are in exactly the right places, we get shin vents, pectoral windows, all this plating that hugs itself neatly around the shoulders. In general, this is a fantastic depiction of Optimus and probably one that deserves Hall of Fame status. Now, he did come with a weapon, a sort of spring out weapon that folded up and looked really weird. Unfortunately, tiny hands came and plundered. And now it's just gone. I have no idea where it went. But there is a solution. Hunting down a generation's Orion Pax, a toy I particularly never been fond of, but hey, he fills a role. Orion Pax. Autobot. A bot barely alive. Aerial bots. I can rebuild it. I have the technology. I have the capability to make the world's first heroic prime. Orion Pax will be that bot. Better than he was before. Better. Stronger. Faster.
Anyway, he came with weapons, first of which being a G1 accurate blaster that Cybertron Prime can use. And ooh, man, what a difference. It's a blaster I actually prefer him using, to be perfectly honest. It just works so much better. The other thing Orion gets is an axe that looks sort of familiar to the one that Prime used in game, so pop that on and then one indeed shall stand and one shall certainly fall. To the vehicle mode. Here we've gone from a highly detailed kibbled and greebled bot into a smooth, sleek and slick looking truck. And the process it took to get here is incredible. Sections of robot shift and rotate and move and slot and fall into place to give us one incredible journey of transformation. Honestly, upsize this, articulate the hands, and slop on the Masterpiece logo because this is one fantastic figure that every collection should have. And if not this version, then at least hunt yourself down a Rage of Cybertron one, both of which are amazing deluxe figures that are a symbol of an era of collecting that is sadly in the past. One where the designers had free liberty to design whoever they felt without having to worry if little Jacob Tutu could pull it off without loading his shorts and crying about it. So being that I find this is the peak era of Transformers, another line of figures surfaced a year later that was just as complex, faithful to source material, and were all around great toys. Or at least, were initially. First edition Transformers Prime figures. Unfortunately, I only have Bumblebee, Optimus, Cliffjumper, and RC, so no thoughts on Bulkhead, and they never made a first edition Ratchet, disappointingly and oddly enough. So Prime turns into a Peterbilt-looking tractor unit, somewhat akin to the movie aesthetic of G2 Optimus, if you prefer. But in... You know, standard Optimus colors, which looks awesome. I know several people when it comes to Optimus are all for the ideal of, it's a cab over or nothing, and well, I actually like these kinds of trucks, so I quite enjoy the look of this one. And that transformation though. Oh man, it's like we turned the whole truck inside out to get to this stature, which I find absolutely crazy about this, because if you look at him, you're not exactly spotting what goes where to makes it a truck. And well, I must admit, figuring this guy out on my own one moving out at X Eagle One's house took me the better half of a movie to finally hit truck mode. Basically, this guy is pretty dang impressive. Bumblebee is everybody's favorite obligatory character. Like, I think the Armada trilogy and the Beast Wars were the only ones to not really feature him. This particular model seems to take heavy movie references into the vehicle mode. Like, it easily looks like the copyright-free version of a Chevy Camaro. And while it doesn't really look all that bad, he also gets to take his arm-mounted cannons, if you so desire, and throw them on top for some engine-mounted artillery. All that being said, though, he is one of the easier first edition figures to come out. Transformed and bam! There he is! And this is where you really see those movie cues shine. He's got the G1 Jazz transformation aesthetic, just like movie B, the lack of talking, and all of that. I, I've talked about Bumblebees over the past six years, and I don't know what really there is more to say. He's black and yellow, this one doesn't talk, the end. RC is a bike, which I'm guessing also got the inspiration from Revenge of the Fallen, turning into a sweet looking road bike, much like she and Alita 1 did in Revenge of the Fallen. You know, the bikes at the beginning of the movie that had no other role, just like Jolt. Oh, he's there guys, don't worry about him. Sam just being a pansy about saying I love you was way more important than his development. Where was I? RC! RC turns into a really awesome looking bike, and the transformation isn't anything to laugh at either. Unlike some of the other bike modes I've seen in recent years, this one actually conceals all of its parts to present this slim, petite, and amazing looking fembot. The wheels split apart and position themselves like heels. The fuel tank splits and becomes the chest. All in all, a fantastic transformation. Finally, Cliff Jumper. TJ Vibe 9 and I covered the Robots in Disguise version of this guy a long time ago, and back then, I couldn't see what the fuss over this guy was about. And then I got the first edition. Well, sort of. This is the GDO, so it's a Transformers Prime figure with a G1 head, which is even more awesome. This particular figure turns himself into a Plymouth-inspired muscle car, something that is just not seen in Transformers nearly enough. And that being said, you have absolutely no idea how psyched I am for the new Bumblebee movie. Look at that, a Plymouth Roadrunner, and it's a Decepticon? That is awesome! Anyway, Cliff Jumper reminds me of an old Dodge Challenger crossed with an old Plymouth Barracuda, and the end result is an amalgamation of two incredibly looking classic muscle cars for one vehicle mode that looks absolutely stunning. Again, I wish we had seen more of the style of Transformer in the alt mode lineups. Classic muscle is a thing of beauty, and I wish it had been represented a bit more. The closest we ever got was the C3 that Trax turned into. And then we transform into Cliff Jumper. The transformation on this guy is epic. 
The doors and fenders become the legs. The headlights actually make their way into the waist. The roof actually splits apart and becomes the chest. There's absolutely no full parts about this transformation, and I absolutely love it to bits. Don't look at those wheels. They don't count. So there we have it. The first of the Transformers Prime lineup, save of course for Bulkhead and Ratchet, but that's okay. Bulkhead was also a great figure based on what I've seen, and it's practically a crime that Ratchet never saw the light of day. In the end though, we live. Now here's a figure I got and then never talked about. Cloud9 Shockwave. Here was a masterpiece Shockwave that wowed all of us with its really low price point. It wasn't ripping off anything, but at the same time it was also minimalistic, only coming with one accessory. Another thing it came with, if you will, was see-through magenta parts. And while yes, I know by doing this I've removed certain light-up features I never use anyway, I have painted the arm cannon, hand, and the inside of the chest piece all a more cartoon-accurate lavender. The shade really makes its appearance on the hand and cannon, however, since there's still magenta plastic visible before you see the lavender, the shades between the hand and cannon isn't exactly the same as the chest despite being the same paint, something I wish I had rectified before painting the hand and cannon, but oh well, what's done was done by that point, regardless, I still like the look. Something else I really enjoyed was how chunky the robot was. Not too chunky, like the reason I got this shockwave wasn't because I saw, ooh, what a deal. Because based on the two options at the time, and at the time of purchase, a third option as well had surfaced for pre-order, this design I thought looked the best. Color maybe could have been better, but the core design of this particular shockwave was just top notch for me. One thing that really caught me off guard when I bought the thing though was just how large it was compared to the other masterpiece figures. Like, here's the other Seekers, which I've come to the conclusion were too small anyway. But I got this guy when I still only had Soundwave, Thundercracker, and Skywarp, so the appearance was only a little jarring. But then, I got Masterpiece Megatron, and man, he just fits right in there with the MP shelf now, doesn't he? Especially more so when compared to the likes of MP29. Like, man, that guy was unnecessarily tiny. Well, since we're on the topic of uncovered Masterpieces, let's talk about the one that started it all. Yep, about two years ago, I found myself a North American MP01 Prime. Unfortunately, this guy had zero accessories, a fender panel missing, and a buttload of paint chips, nicks and dings. Some would say, ugh, what poor condition this guy is in. Myself, on the other hand, look at this and go, wow, what amazing weathering. Yes, a huge difference between this Masterpiece Prime and, say, this Masterpiece Prime is that the majority of the figure is made of die-cast metal. This makes this figure rather heavy first off, but for every paint chip where bare metal is exposed, it's just a little closer to a weathered appearance. Like, this truck has been on the road since 84, doing long-haul trips for 34 years. He's seen things, hauled things, met people. But man, this truck just keeps on going. As opposed to MP10, which looks fresh out of the factory, and we can neither confirm nor deny if this machine has ever hauled a trailer. In fact, I'll bet he just walks wherever he goes and transforms and expects his trailer to do all the work for him. To be honest, I can't rag on MP10 too much, because on the plus side, MP10 actually resembles much closer, not just the G1 toy truck, but closer resembles an actual truck, whereas MP01... doesn't? Like, he's obviously a truck, he's just... an ugly one. However, that being said, MP01 does get way better details to boot, such as molding running lights instead of weird little nubs painted yellow in the US and for some reason ignored in Japan, a much sleeker looking flatbed, actual suspension, both molded detail and springs, a much better tail light array, and so on. Long story short, while obviously a fictitious truck, I love MP01 for what he was. He started an era, and this being the first in a long-running masterpiece line, which at the time nobody knew where this line would go. The amount of detail in the truck alone is staggering, and we haven't even hit the bot yet. So let's do that. Hot Rockets. This guy is big. Here's MP22 for size comparison, and he's actually bigger than Magnus at head height. Magnus does edge him out though, but only with shoulder stacks. So that level of detail I was referring to, top to bottom, everything that impressed me to the 11th power. Elbow pistons. Not just one either, four per elbow. It's like they were trying to fathom how a robot this size would actually function. And I am all about this level of detail. And that goes for the angles too with a pair of industrial strength dual pistons per side, as well as molded painted detail behind the knees for extra robotic goodness. These shin vents are flat flush and smooth for the truck mode, but when it comes to the robot, an internal mechanism rotates the vent vents into the robot cartoon accurate design, almost as if they were exhaust vents for how much heat the motor mechanisms produce for carrying the weight of a full-fledged truck as a robot. And something else the MP line kind of stops doing much to quite a few people's dismay, individually articulated fingers. That all being said, this guy wasn't perfect. 
While much of him was die-cast, a few parts, his size specifically, were made of flimsy, creaky plastic. That and the angles didn't really support the figure all that well either. So while I loved the figure for what it was, MP10 was a welcome addition as an MP Prime 2.0. Much like when the rumored MP Prime 3.0 finally arrives, so everyone will probably go, oh yeah, a definite and necessary update for MP10. Another thing everyone talks about though is how out of scale he ended up being. He was just too big for the rest of the line, highlighted by the fact that the alternators ended up being designed to this scale. And while this guy ended up being too big, another MP of the original masterpieces ended up being too small. That being him Grimlock King. MP08, or in this case North American's MP03, is a masterpiece Grimlock with the crown, and oh boy was I bummed that I didn't get the bowtie apron and drink tray instead. That's okay though, him Grimlock King. But I remember wanting this figure for the longest time, and then I got it, and... Wow, I was disappointed. He looks like Grimlock. He has a cool flip the visor color feature, but that's it. The light up hand means no articulation in the right hand. The hips are loose and keep flopping all over the place. The shoulder articulation is lame. Like I said, he looks like a masterpiece Grimlock, but he really isn't one. And then we get the same story. He's too small. The neck articulation is tied to a waggle tail. And in general, no, I didn't like masterpiece Grimmy here. He doesn't feel like a masterpiece, more so than the Seekers don't feel like masterpiece anymore, and he looks super doofy when scales alongside figures like Wheeljack, and especially Megatron, which makes it even more weird when you think he doesn't look good with MP36, which is smaller than Megatron version 1, which came before this Grimlock. So what a strange figure. Long story short, I delayed reviewing this for so long simply due to lack of interest. I had the figure for a week, I got hyped, I tried filming it twice, and the figure kept falling over, and I just made it not fun. If you guys ever wanted to know which Masterpiece figure I ended up regretting buying, you're looking at it. On the other hand, you want to know what Masterpiece I didn't regret buying? It's this guy! Sun Surge from Bad Q came out around the same time as one other competitor, that being Omnigonix's first attempt at Masterpiece style figures. A super lousy one at that. I mean... Wow, what a train wreck. This guy, on the other hand, was an incredible rendition of the yellow Lamborghini brother. Though oddly enough, one that everybody dropped like a stone the moment the official was announced. And the official was announced in spite of heavy, heavy rumors that a masterpiece jazz was afoot. Much to my dismay was false. But instead, MB39 ended up being Sunstreaker. And what do you all see in this thing? Like, everyone's biggest complaint about Sun Surge was a complex transformation and faux parts. And well, it's not like the official fare is much better, especially in the faux parts department. And if nothing else, Sun Surge has a much better head sculpt by far. This looks like Sunstreaker. This looks like Robin Williams in a Countach suit. Again, with the going way too far into animation faithfulness, animation was made to be cheaply made. Why do our masterpiece figures have to look like the cheap animation style? <sighs> Last time I'm going to say it, I promise. Masterpiece was best when it was the perfect blend between toy and cartoon. And I totally get to that to some people, this is the best thing since Optimus Prime got a version 2.0. But man, I miss me some sharp angles. Anyway, vehicle mode. I won't deny it, the transformation is complex. Like, maybe a little too complex, but I personally enjoy complex. However, I will admit that when animating and I have 12 complex figures that I need all in vehicle mode at once for a shot that I want to shoot in 3 minutes, it does get a little tedious. Other than that though, this is a great representation of a Lamborghini Countach that I'm sure Lamborghini has no idea exists, but ah, 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 wait, the taillights are different. And there's an unlicensed short ram intake manifold, so it's clearly not a Lamborghini product. Some people have complained about the taillights, I'm honestly not bothered by them. It's intended to be a nod to the toy, and they don't really look near as bad as everyone whines they are. And if they bother you that much, Toy Hacks has labels that help differentiate taillights from exhaust pipes, so there you go. All in all, I enjoyed Sunstreaker. He's a figure I purchased after finding out Sunstreaker was released, so I found this guy at half price from everyone wanting to ditch the official as soon as they could. And it's a purchase I never once regretted. The articulation had a wide range, the aesthetics hit all the right notes, and I just really, really enjoyed my time playing with this figure. He looks great next to Sideswipe, and even looks great next to a Chug Seeker that everyone keeps asking about. This is Dr. Shockwave and Stein Seeker, or Frankenseeker. A lot of people keep asking, just what is Frankenseeker? Where do you get him? Where can I get one? Well, the answer was simple, really. 
Over the years, I had collected a ton of classic seekers. Some official, a ton of them KO, and therefore with all the broken, dilapidated, and cannibalized seeker parts, I tore everything apart and had it down to bare parts, and with what good parts I had left, cobbled together the classic seeker of all seekers, Frankenseeker, comprised of Thundercracker, Ghost Starscream, the first universe Starscream with a terrible wing design, and a Skywarp. I debated hunting down a conehead for extra variety, but had decided against it. Tearing apart already broken Seekers, mostly KOs at that, is one thing, but wrecking a perfectly good figure that some are still looking for is a bit of another. That being said, after a conversation with a fan of this design, I found out he's in the middle of hunting down KO Masterpiece 11s to do a similar treatment. So, I hope to see an image of that floating around the internet one day, but who knows. Anyway, with that out of the way, did you know that you can configure Classic's thrust into a more tune accurate appearance? All you gotta do is pop the wings off their pegs and swap them while in robot mode and ta-da! Tune accurate thrust, just in case anyone was wondering. Well, we're winding down with a final few figures, and more recently, Power of the Prime and Titan's Return came out, showering us with all sorts of oddities from Season 3, Headmasters, and beyond. So that seems a good reason that I need to finish off with those. Double Cross, or Twinferno, is a character I have no previous connection with. He's apparently an Autobot that has split personality disorder, so why do I have him? Well, I had to pick him up for a review for labels for Toy Hacks when I was doing that gig, and I am sure glad I did. He is just such a fun figure, as much as a two-headed dragon would be. Like, he's a two-headed dragon. A two-headed dragon. That's just amazing. And then he transforms, and those dragon heads become the hands, and a really good-looking head skull pops itself on top of the neck area. This is just a really, really cool idea for a figure, and the play value just writes itself. Hey, hey! My wing is not your drying rack! Well, I wouldn't have to hang my towel on your side if you actually fixed the towel rack. Hey, how can I fix the bathroom rack with only one hand when you refuse to help? Hey, if I want to watch Teletron while GoBots is on, that's my right as half of this monstrosity! Oh yeah? Yeah! <laughs> again, again, again! Highbrow is another character I have no previous connection with. I, uh... I haven't really watched Headmasters, really. I'm sorry. A friend of mine really insists I try the English dub, though, and watch the many adventures of Sparkle, Philip, and Spaceship Bruce. Full disclosure, I had to look that bit up. I was told about Spike translated to Sparkle, but... Philip and Spaceship Bruce?! I am totally watching this after this video gets posted. Anyway, why do I have Highbrow? Well, I don't. This belongs to X-Eagle 1 again. So then why am I reviewing Highbrow? Because I like to think that in an alternate universe, the lazy highbrow reviewer reviews us all, as does Warp's Awesome Humans reviews, Bees Collectibles, and Opterotomus. Lame humor aside, he's actually a pretty cool dual-bladed helicopter, supposedly just like in the show, and again, I do have to give mad props to Hasbro and Takara for being faithful to the original aesthetics while still making them their own, much like the Season 3 and Headmasters design really allow them to be. Here's a fun fact. Did you know there's a hatch under the cockpit that accepts 3mm display stand plugs? So you can even get that helicopter flying with a track stand. It's really, really awesome it can do this, intentional or not. Bot mode looks pretty snazzy as blue helicopters should, and the fact that the cockpit is still accessible means that he can fly around and point and shoot. How nifty is that? So here's another thing. Much like Frankenseeker that everyone keeps asking me about, what was my version of Betatron all about? So for Superion, we got a brand new member, that being Alpha Bravo. And in the generally accepted configuration, he replaced Slingshot as the left arm. When Manasaur hit, Offroad replaced Wild Rider as the left leg. Rook replaced Groove as the generally accepted right leg, and Blastoff ruined it by being still Blastoff and not calling himself Takeoff or something else instead, and apparently this is still Blastoff despite Power of the Primes actually giving us a proper Blastoff, this time configured so he goes without a Shuttle Bra. Regardless, this is still the right arm. Then, a scatter shot came out without the rest of the Technobots. And very few people bought it, but got the Computron box set instead. And if they did get the scatter shot, had no idea what to do with an unpainted Computron calling himself Betatron. So what I did was take it and make Betatron, made out of all the new figures that mostly nobody asked for. Yes, these are the figures outcast by society and left in the corner to rot, upset by their abandonment. The five bots set aside their faction differences and banded together to make Betatron, the wandering Gestalt, who has decided to not get involved in the petty war between Megatron and Optimus and their many, many forces. Well, enough of that, headcanon. Here's how he stacks up to Superion. And aside from the fact that I never hunted down any hands and feet, this guy looks really good. 
He's got the chunky vehicle modes that I love so much as legs, the aircraft that work fantastically as arms, and to top it off, it's built on my favorite torso out of the Combiner Wars line, that being Silverbolt. So it's pretty much Bruticus, but with a much better torso. Basically, out of all 11 Combiners I've owned or reviewed, which if you're trying to keep track of, Hercules, Intimidator, Menasaur, Superion, Defensor, Bruticus, Victorion, Halky, Computron, Devastator, and Betatron, this is my favorite configuration out of all of them. I think I'm a little sad though that I didn't spend more time beefing this thing up and customizing it to look a lot better than it does. The unpainted scatter shot really does bring the aesthetics down a hair. If you're looking for my opinion on Computron, here we go. The hands and feet were awesome, I loved the tank and car's legs, the bike was alright, and the space fighter looked super super weird, especially with cybacks of all things tagging along, and the North American Saturn shot just ended up being super inaccurate to the point of, why does this exist? This is one figure where I really can't recommend trying to find the North American version as the Takara one was just so much better. So being that this guy can interchange with pretty much anybody, and nobody would even bat an eye and say, but that's wrong! We can even throw in a jazz. Yes, this is a figure that showed up at my Walmart as I was nearing the end of filming, and boy am I ever so glad that I get to talk about this guy. Not just because I called both this and Inferno, and by called it, I mean they should do it, and I'm so glad they did, but because of what this jazz is. They made a jazz, and it combines. Gather together your Mirage, Optimus, Sunstreaker, and pretend that Lightspeed is Wind Charger, and you're ready to relive that episode Masquerade where Optimus and company tried to pass off as Menasaur. But that's not the only reason I love this thing. Here's G1 Jazz, a Porsche 935 Martini livery. Here's a reveal of S.H.I.E.L.D. release they did some time ago, a mix of G1 and the Soul Assist that Jazz was in the movie that released about the same time this came out. And here's Trashy Fall Cybertron Jazz. All three of these figures are roughly the same shape and are going for the same sort of look, give or take a few details here and there. So Lazy Eyebrow, why on earth would you appreciate this figure that deviates so heavily from the source material? And the answer is, it doesn't. In fact, it actually gets closer to the source material than Reveal the Shield or Fall of Cybertron ever did. Power of the Prime's Jazz doesn't say, let's make Jazz exactly like he's always been. No. Power of the Prime's Jazz asks, what if? What if Jazz woke up in the late 70s instead of the mid 80s? And lo and behold, here we have a Jazz that's not a 935, but in fact, a Porsche 936. Yep. This Jazz is also stylized off a real-world Porsche racing machine in Martini livery. And man, I just cannot get enough of the fact that they did this. It's a brand new design, but it's still faithful to the original, so to speak. It's based off a Group 6 race car that competed at the 24-hour Le Mans from the 70s. Two things I really hope Transformers does more of in the future, both race cars and 70s vehicles. And just seeing these two cars together, man, it's a great time to be a Porsche racing and Transformers fan. And then we pop into robot mode, and yep, there is no denying that this is Jazz through and through. Oh man, I am honestly really glad I got a chance to cover this before the channel ended. I was super excited when I saw photos, but I mean, to have it in hand? Wow, what a figure indeed. It also compresses and makes itself into a leg really, really well, might I add. Find yourself a quick slinger, Alpha Bravo, and a Rook, and all the white really provides an excellent contrast to Scattershot's red. I really love the look of this, I gotta say. So now we've come to our final figure. Jazz, in standard tradition, was not only the second last review, but the second last figure in the final review. So now, almost two hours later, let's look at Astro Train. Titan's Return Astro Train is finally living up to the name Train, and I could not be more satisfied by this. An argument could be made that this Astro Train was technically a train also, but this guy... This guy is a full-on war train with two AC4400 locomotives and four artillery cars that would just make tunnels eh, just a wee bit difficult, wouldn't it? Past Astrotrains have really only been a locomotive, but this Astrotrain is a palindrome of pain, ready to bring destruction no matter which way it's traveling. Just look at all that sculpted detail, with locomotives strongly representing an AC4400, or an argument can be made for a Dash 9. Moving up here, we see forward cannons, ready to take out oncoming traffic, or wreck anything Astrotrain rolls on up to. Molded detail that I've picked out in silver, highlights wheels, stairways, handrails, and so on, really giving you a sense of scale that this figure should be. An upper control center resides on top to orchestrate this dangerous leviathan of death. In general, this is a stinking massive train. Just in terms of it all, it's molded detail lending to its scale. It's armed to the teeth. And I personally couldn't be happier that this is one of the alt modes. So let's look at the other one. 
The train folds itself in half to become a space-worthy battle cruiser. I cannot emphasize enough how much I truly love what they've done to Astrotrain. By doing this, they first off negated the question of scale pretty much. Yeah, I believe that two heavy-duty locomotives and four cars could twist, deform, and merge into one giant space cruiser. And second, what a way cooler alt mode just by itself. Like, I love the space shuttle and all, but this is just so much cooler. Those sweeping wings, those forward artillery cannons, the intake manifolds, everything about this design just hits all the right notes for me. It's fantastic. And finally, robot mode. Robot mode is just as fantastic. There is absolutely no denying that this is Astrotrain, and while the Takara does get a more animation accurate charcoal, you'd still be hard pressed to whine about the North American release not being cartoon accurate enough. I mean, it's not like he's pure white again. Talking about scale though, I get the feeling that with him not only being a train, but also a full on battle cruiser, you'd think he'd be at very least Omega Supreme size, but I guess not. Oh well. So that's been my review of, well, Everything I never covered. Space, the final buffet. These are the voyages of the USS Unicron. My continuing mission, to explore strange new meals. To seek out new life and then consume them. To boldly dine where no bot has dined before. Which is... A lot. So let's quickly take a look at what I've all reviewed in the last six years. And now, the figures I've reviewed, brought to you by Decepticon Megatron! Optimus Megatron, Bumblebee, Beta, Trump, Substitute, Cassette, Swipe, and Jazz. Voice of Defense, Hellfire, Skywarp, and Menace, so Starscream is kind of a spaz. In Sector Count, Trapdoor, with Kid Mac and Bob Show, they make up a sub team of cons. Sea Spacer, Rebus, with Blaster, and Cosmos, and Cliff, Chumper, Huffer, and Braun. There's Scrap, and Mix, Master, Bird, Crusher, and Scavenger, Logo, and finally Hook. Streetwise, and Infestate, Hotspot, and Groove, and Blaze, can't forget you remember Rook. Abby and Riley did rumble in frenzy with laser big rabbits but saw. Ram jet and sandwich with thrusters and chalk wave. There was no review for a door. Hearts of steel nemesis, red as a pessimist. Gridlock sucks and shit swoop. Warp our superior, knocked into Lorian. This red SUV was poop. This slingshot and airy with skydive and firefight. Silver ball rounds at the team. Storm gas and skybirds and their trusty bus rest as magnet dust up a jump stream. T-Bone and Carcass with downforce and last jet same motor master made a scoff. Scorch and Cyclonus and also makes Brutic as Brawl Vortex Windle Blast off. Hot Rod and Magnus and Skylev and Samus with Grapple Mirage and Smokescreen. Finally, Hedgemon, Saga, Bird, Pokemon, Trivial, Jack, Rao, and RC. There's six other Optimus fights with the bottom as everything scales with a B. Third party Megatron's lazy eyebrow and troll talk was right check my wheelie. Ratchet and Iron High movie first barricade with cheaper center and tracks. Here's Thundercracker, it's bring as a wrecker, but gun no match for Fort Max. Wrecker and Astro Trek, Galvatron was insane, devastated, made us cry. Minimus Abyss, it's Idol Trip Magnus, the comments would not let them die. There's Six Shot and Skyfire, alternative Jetfire, Trailbreaker, Spencer, and Blur. Metroplex Power Glide, Ratchet and Iron Hide. Hulky and Hercules, Inferno, if you please, double cross on streak and jazz on his two speakers, Frank and Seeker and Highbrow. So that's it. I'm done. This will probably be the last video you will ever see on this channel. I can't guarantee that, but like 99% chance this will be the last video you'll ever see. We've moved to Moncton. I've... Better be. Better be. Uh, we've moved to Moncton. I've sold all my Transformers, and now my job, my hobby if you will, is looking after these two. <laughs> who are now fighting over Mother's attention. <laughs> we'll sit on God. So where am I going from here? Well, who knows? Um, I'm done with YouTube. Uh, just... As a reviewer. As a reviewer. No, just making videos, I mean. Any type of video for, for YouTube. Just because they keep changing their platform and all the joy has been sucked out of it. And even just 
doing this has been so much time devoted to this, just to keep it going and to stay relevant. I just... I think it's time to move on, and these girls are my focus, and as well as a few other things too. And well, my wife. My wife is my focus. <laughs> so, I think what I'm trying to say is... Thanks for watching for the past six years. Farewell from the Lazy Highbrow Reviewer. Goodbye!